Our next speaker this afternoon is Dr Frances Hall and she's going to be here talking to us about Sjogren's and Raynaud's disease. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you Sheila for, and the team, the whole team for organising this and it's amazing to see such a wonderful turnout today. Uh, let's see if I can get the pointer to work before I start. Promising. Okay, um, so this was I think your vote. Um, but the idea was that I would talk about some lupus-associated conditions, and let's face it, you had a wide choice there, didn't you? But what you, you chose for me to talk about were two conditions, Raynaud's phenomenon and Sjogren's syndrome, both of which, as I'm sure you know, can be standalone conditions that aren't actually part of lupus themselves, but both are, are also very common in the context of, of lupus. So um, that just sets in context some of your other um, myriad of choices, and I don't need to tell you more about that because I know that many of you live with some of those symptoms or many of those symptoms. Oh, by the way, I hope you like the artwork and you can muse on why I've chosen what I've chosen as we, as we go through the talk. And you'll see it shifts um, as we go from Reynos to, to um, Sjogren's, and you can see if you can tell me why at the end. Right, so what I'm going to do in the first um, part of the talk um, is I'm going to talk around Raynaud's, what it is, um, and what we, what we mean when we talk about primary Raynaud's compared to secondary Raynaud's, what sort of things make it worse. Obviously, that's quite helpful to understand because it informs you as to how you might help it not getting worse. What sort of situations you ought to let your doctor know about, either your GP or your rheumatologist, what sort of medications we use, and a few tips and tricks. I have to say, you can probably tell me a lot more tips and tricks as well. We might discuss that in the break. So, first of all, um, what is it? Well, the, the classical description of Raynaud's was made 150, 151 years ago now by, by um, Maurice Raynaud, and it was a classic red, white, and blue colour change of the fingers. Um, but Raynaud's can also affect um, feet and nose, and actually the patelli, the kneecaps sometimes as well. And I've, I've shown you here the classical, well, red white and blue change. So the, the white occurs when the blood vessels shut down and there's no blood getting in or very little blood getting into the tissue. So instead of being a pinkish colour, it turns white. As the oxygen in, that, in, in the remaining haemoglobin in that area gets used up, the blood turns from red, a reddish colour, to a bluish colour. We call that cyanosis. So that's when the oxygen's used up. And then in Raynaud's, at some point, the blood vessels open up again and the blood rushes back in and um, that's often when it's really painful, actually, when the blood gets back in. Um, so um, coldness, obviously, and pain can be symptoms of this. Pain often during the, the reperfusion part. But also, pardon me, also sometimes a numbness and a tingling of the fingers. And when this goes on for some time, dryness of the skin, just because the blood flow is not getting in to provide all the growth factors and nutrients that the skin needs. And this cartoon here just shows um, that happening at the vascular level. So you can hear, see here the, the digital arteries up the side of the finger. And here's a nice wide artery carrying the blood into the, the fingers. And this is what happens to it when it goes into vasospasm. And of course, this is something that happens to all of us. And sometimes appropriately, if it's a very cold day and we haven't got gloves on, that's exactly what we want uh, the blood vessels in our fingers to do, to keep all the nice warm blood deep inside. But if this happens frequently to you when you're not in a particularly cold environment, that's not desirable. Now, the factors that control that happening are actually very complicated, and they include um, nerves, which come and, and uh, latch on to the little muscles in the walls of the arteries. It includes hormones that circulate around the the bloodstream and hormones such as adrenaline, for example, which tend to, to cause um, blood vessels to constrict. But it also um, includes a lot of factors that are made locally around the little cells themselves in the wall of the arteries, governing whether they relax or contract. So there, was an awful lot of, there are an awful lot of factors that, that come to play in whether blood vessels are open or closed um, in these locations. And this oxidative stress, threatening looking arrow here, is something that occurs when you've got inflammation going on or damage. And of course, that's the sort of mechanism where the sorts of immune abnormalities that David Jane was just talking about come to play in the context of lupus. If there is inflammation going on, damage of the lining of the blood vessels, then we can get that sort of oxidative damage. 
Now, um, many of you, or some of you, may have heard people talk about primary Raynaud's and secondary Raynaud's, or Raynaud's disease, which is synonymous with primary Raynaud's, or Raynaud's phenomenon, which is when we talk about Raynaud's in the context of another disease. Primary Raynaud's is a standalone condition. It doesn't occur, uh, or it occurs without another major medical condition underlying it, and it's very common. Probably about 15% of the population have it. So slightly more women than, than, than men. Uh, but it's generally benign, well, it's really always benign in that context, and, and is really just a, an intermittent, inappropriate coldness and uh, whiteness or blueness of the, of the hand. Now, for, for any uh, doctors in the audience that are interested in how you tell the difference if somebody turns up in your surgery with cold hands, it can be helpful to run a, an ANA test, because a positive ANA might suggest that you're in a connective tissue or autoimmune ballpark, and also looking at the capillaries in the, in the, in the nail fold um, of, the, of the finger with a, just an ophthalmoscope can be helpful because you can see an abnormal shape of the capillaries in the secondary Raynaud's um, people. Secondary Raynaud's, I think, as everybody here knows, occurs often in the context of lupus. Probably about 40% of patients with lupus have some degree of, of Raynaud's. But it also occurs in other um, autoimmune conditions as well. Nearly all patients with systemic sclerosis, sorry, that's supposed to say systemic sclerosis, about 95% of them will have some form of Raynaud's. Right, so if you have it, whether you have primary Raynaud's or secondary Raynaud's, what sorts of things tend to bring it on or make it worse? Um, well, perhaps not surprisingly, going out in the cold um, makes it worse. But perhaps it's not so obvious that stress or emotion um, might make it worse. Um, clearly, if you make a lot of adrenaline, you're, you're more likely to have um, constriction of the, the vessels in your periphery, so that's part of the, uh, of the problem. Um, unfortunately, some of the drugs that we use, sometimes to help other, fe other features of lupus, can themselves make the, make the fingers colder. So drugs such as um, beta blockers, like atenolol, which might be used to treat heart rhythm disorders, or amitriptyline, which might be used to treat chronic pain syndromes or mood um, dysregulation, that uh, also can make the peripheries colder. And so sometimes a discussion is required between you and your doctor as to you know, which, which, is, is, which gains the upper hand, really, the beneficial effects of those drugs or the adverse effects of those drugs. Um, now, having an inactive or under, underactive thyroid can also make your peripheries cooler, um, and that's one of the reasons why we tend to, to check your thyroid function at least once a year when you come to see us. And I'm afraid this doesn't bode well for this afternoon, does it? But inactivity, so sitting still for long periods of time, also have a, a rather um, adverse effect on the, on the peripheral circulation. So obviously you can flip that on its head and um, infer that actually moving around is a good thing. Right, now I, I know that many of you will be far more expert in uh, the study of Raynaud's phenomenon than, uh, than I am and that you've lived with it for many years, but it's actually quite important sometimes to realise when what you're looking at is not um, simply uh, Raynaud's phenomenon, although as I've just pointed out, Raynaud's phenomenon isn't actually that simple itself. But there are other conditions that can go along with pain or coldness in the fingers that are actually um, uh, very serious and that doctors need to know about. Or there are just other conditions that are um, associated with pain in the fingers and have a completely different cause, uh, which have a different uh, management strategy. So um, up at the, the top right-hand panel here, um, you can see that this individual has got um, little spots. You probably can't see, or well, it's diff more difficult to appreciate on the picture, that these are raised spots and they're tender. If you get tender raised spots, particularly if they're purplish and they don't blanch, uh, don't turn white when you press them. That might be an inflammatory problem called vasculitis, which sometimes occurs in Raynaud's in the small blood vessels. And that is certainly something to tell your doctor or your rheumatologist or your nephrologist about. This, I think you can appreciate, is rather serious as well. If any of the ends of your fingers turn purple or black and the blood flow never gets into them, that's a very serious problem. And that needs to be dealt with separately. Now, fortunately, this is very unusual in the context of lupus. It happens commonly in other connective tissue diseases, but if you get persistent ulcers, particularly at the end of your fingers, we need to know about that. Now, this one at the bottom might not be so obvious because um, chillblains, uh, certainly before people had central heating, chillblains were very common in the general population. It's a sort of milder version of frostbite, really. Um, but if you have a lot of chillblains in the context of lupus, it can go along with your lupus being active, 
generally throughout your body, and so that's useful for us to know about. Now, people with Raynaud's often complain about tingling or numbness, but that tends to come and go with the Raynaud's. Sometimes it is a permanent fixture, but it usually comes and goes. If you have a different sort of tingling and numbness, which just affects particular parts of the hand and tends to come on, for example, at night and in the morning, that can actually indicate a, a nerve compression, some pressure on a nerve. The most common site is at the wrist, and some of you will have heard of carpal tunnel syndrome, or some of you may even have had surgery for carpal tunnel syndrome. But sometimes in lupus, nerves themselves can get inflamed. And so if you have a, um, a tingling or numbness pattern that's always in the same place and doesn't involve the whole hand, then again, that's something that's worth mentioning. As is the so-called glove, and incidentally stocking, glove and stocking distribution <coughs> problems go together. Glove and stocking pattern numbness or tingling in the hands and feet can indicate a, a widespread problem with the nerves, which can be a result of the lupus itself or sometimes the, the drugs. Right, so those are a few things to look out for. Now, what do we do about this? Um, well, in the context of lupus, we um, first and foremost try to control the underlying um, disease activity by the strategies that, that uh, David Jane was just talking to us about. Um, but assuming we still have a significant um, Reno's related problem when the disease is as quiet as it can be, then we think about attacking that in its own right. And obviously, from what we've just been talking about, it would seem sensible to try and open up the blood vessels to let more um, blood flow in. And there are a number of, um, of agents that we use for this. So the so-called cal calcium channel blockers like nifedipine, those uh, are used very widely. And in Cambridge, we use a lot of losartan, the angiotensin receptor blockers, which have a, a gentler uh, vasodilator effect, but might actually help to calm down the wall of the, of the artery. And similarly, ACE inhibitors that probably work in a similar way. Interestingly, um, one of the uh, antidepressants, and possibly more than one, possibly a family of antidepressants, but fluoxetine, one of the antidepressants, has some evidence associated with that that it also can improve uh, Raynaud's. And of course, um, most of you, well, all of you will have heard of sildenafil, also known as uh, Viagra. That's reputed to be very good for opening up blood vessels, and indeed, it, um, it does very well with, uh, with fingers too. A uh, little bit uh, harder to get hold of, I have to say. It's rather expensive and does raise an eyebrow or two, but um, the feedback is extremely good. Um, <laughs> Topical nitrates, not quite as exciting, but it's an interesting um, approach. This is uh, the, the use of nitrate patches, the sort of patches that sometimes people wear to open up their coronary arteries, but to help to open up the, the blood, blood vessels in the fingers. And then for some of you, this is not so common in lupus, but for some of you, if the fingers are always cold and painful, and, and particularly if you get problems like gangrene or the ulcers, then we'll use a... Uh, a an intravenous treatment called Ilopros, which involves you coming into hospital for three to five days to open up the blood vessels. Um, in the past, I think more than, than currently, it was um, uh, fashionable to use sympathectomy to cut the little nerves that go to the, the blood vessels, the sort of nerves that tell them to constrict. And we do occasionally still do that, but I have to say I don't feel that that's, some, that's a wild, wildly successful approach, but it does have a place in the otherwise resistant um, vasospastic disorders. And I've just put at the bottom there antiplatelet and anticoagulant agents, and um, the sharp-eyed among you will, will, will know that those are to do with thinning the blood and stopping the blood from clotting, so it might seem a little bit uh, peculiar to, to use these to, to deal with Raynaud's. There are a subpopulation of people in, in, in lupus, as I'm sure you all know, that have the sticky blood problem where, they have, where they have um, antibodies which target the clotting cascade and the lining of the blood vessels. And it just make, means that the blood is a little bit more likely to clot in places than it shouldn't. And sometimes this can happen in the small blood vessels and can contribute to a sluggish blood flow through the microcirculation, through the small blood vessels in the fingers and other sites. Right, so this is where I've, I've learned all sorts of things from my patients over the years. These are sorts of sensible um, and sometimes inspired things that you can do to help yourself. And, and there is a booklet that you can download from um, the Arthritis Research UK website with this and much more information in it. 
So obviously, since cold makes it worse, keep yourself warm. Um, you put gloves on, and sometimes wrist warmers are quite, quite helpful because you can wear them, or the fingerless gloves, so you can still do dexterous tasks, but whilst keeping most of your ha hand warm. Perhaps less obvious to think about your core, keeping your core temperature warm, your, your, your core warm, and putting layers on as we go into the winter, putting multiple layers on, and thinking about putting your coat on several minutes before you go outside allows you to warm up and keep all that um, as warm as possible so the blood will get through to your fingers. None of us can uh, avoid stress in this life, I'm afraid, um, but having some kind of strategy for dealing with it, particularly if you have an ongoing uh, uh, stressful situation like uh, Tai Chi or other, other strategies, gentle exercise is a good one, um, that's very worthwhile. Um, having a chat with your GP or your rheumatologist or nephrologist about your drugs, particularly drugs that maybe are helping something else but making the Raynos worse, that, that's sort of certainly worth considering. Um, and I'm a doctor, so you'll obviously expect me to tell you to stop smoking if you're smoking, but um, components of, 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 of cigarettes actually are vasospastic, and so it's not a good idea, and your GP will be very happy to help with that. We generally will look after the thyroid function side for you, and the inactivity, as I say, we are making worse this afternoon, but um, generally we'd encourage you to do gentle, regular exercise. Right, so... Moving on now, um, Sjögren's syndrome. Now, I downloaded some pictures from Salvador Dali, and the more pictures I looked at this afternoon, the more I decided that he must have suffered from Sjögren's himself. I mean, look at this picture. It really it says to me, you know, uh, 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 or provides a very good top projection of what it must feel like to have Sjögren's. I'm going to follow a similar sort of trajectory through Sjögren's as I've done with Reynolds. So what is it, first of all? Now, Sjögren's syndrome, whether it's occurring on its own or in the context of lupus, is caused by the immune system behaving badly again, as um, David um, showed us very nicely in those cartoons before. Um, but in Sjögren's, the, the immune uh, abnormal activity has a predilection for attacking glandular tissue. And glands occur in lots of places, glands that produce little secretions that flow out of little ducts into areas like your mouth and your gut and your lacrimal glands, tear glands. So tear glands and salivary glands are very commonly targeted by this. But importantly, glands in all sorts of other mucosal surfaces, that's where the wet parts of the body meet the outside world, they're also affected. So dry vagina, irritable bowel syndrome, irritable bladder, all those things can be problematic as well. And those are the, the local effects of the immune response attacking the glandular tissue. And sometimes that, that's really the scope of, of, of Sjögren's. But for a lot of patients, they also have so-called systemic effects, effects that, 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 that they feel throughout their body. And the number one complaint that people bring to us is fatigue. And it's one of the things that we are um, least useful at helping them with. But the fatigue they're describing isn't just being a little bit tired, and as I don't think I need to explain to you, it's often a flu-like uh, uh, feeling, or an absolutely devastating fatigue, and it probably has a lot to do with those cytokine abnormalities that David Jane was showing you, particularly that overproduction of interferon alpha, because that's something that we often produce when we have flu. It's good for, for disadvantaging viruses, but it's not great if our body's doing it all the time. So experiencing fatigue and the sort of joint and muscle aching that one gets in flu, but also importantly with Sjögren's, there is an increased risk of lymphoma. That's a, a sort of cancer of the, of, the, of the lymphocytes. And it's very important to look out for because it's, it's usually very treatable, but obviously the sooner it's spotted, the better. Now I'll just put at the bottom a statistic that's quite interesting. Quite a, aside from lupus, Sjögren's is much more common than people think and probably affects about one in a hundred of the population. So um, how do you know if you have Sjögren's? What sort of thing might you experience? Well, I've described some of them already, but classically, dry eyes and dry mouth. So a feeling of dryness or grittiness in the mouth, often blurred vision which clears on, on blinking, um, a persistent dry mouth, and importantly, um, accelerated tooth decay because saliva doesn't just produce a watery sort of substance, it also produces lots of immune components which attack the bacteria in the mouth. So having a dry mouth is a big problem for the teeth. And it's also a problem when you come to swallow because it's really hard to swallow a dry piece of food that isn't properly wetted and lubricated. <coughs> 
Now, involvement of all the other mucosae that I talked to you about was also a problem. So irritable bowel um, can cause diarrhoea, constipation. A dry vagina can cause painful intercourse. And also an upset sort of lining of the bladder can, can lead to having to rush to the loo quite, quite urgently without a lot of warning. I haven't mentioned the skin particularly with Sjogren's, but there are lots of little glands in the skin that produce all sorts of secretions that oil and protect the skin. And so getting dry and often itchy skin is part of the, of the broader sort of syndrome of Sjogren's. And of course with the systemic involvement, fatigue and sweats and just feeling uh, flu-like are part of the picture. Um, now I won't dwell too much on this, but there are ways that, that doctors use these um, symptoms along with blood tests and antibody levels and sometimes a, a biopsy of just the lining of your mouth which picks up a few of the microscopic little glands in the lining of the mouth. We use those to diagnose whether somebody's got definitive primary Sjogren's or secondary Sjogren's and if Sjogren's occurs with lupus then that's secondary Sjogren's because it's occurring with another um, autoimmune condition. Right, so if you have this kind of problem, if you have these dryness symptoms, or sometimes uh, they're known as sicker symptoms, what sort of things make it worse? Well, again, I suspect a lot of you could tell me um, this rather better than I can tell you, but if the environment is hot and dry, so if you have air conditioning, or interestingly, um, central heating, which is worth thinking about as we go into this time of the year, if you're doing something very, very dusty, particularly in a dry environment, all of that can actually make, make it worth, worse. If you're having problems with, uh, with um, blockage in your, in your nose, you're having um, rhinitis, runny nose, or you're having difficulty breathing through your nose and you tend to breathe a lot through your mouth, that obviously can make your mouth drier. If you get yourself dehydrated, and again, if people also have diabetes and the blood sugar levels are a little bit high, they have a tendency to get a little bit dry, so that can be a problem. And again, I'm afraid some of the drugs that we give you, water tablets for obviously drying you out a little bit, and amitriptyline, our old favourite again, and others like gabapentin, they themselves can, can cause some dryness, dryness of the mouth. Right, so again, um, living with this is, is one issue to consider, but also I'd just like to flag up a few things that, it, that it's worth discussing specifically with your doctor, because they're not just the sicker symptoms associated with Sjogren's. So sometimes when you have a dry mouth, and particularly if you're taking steroids, for example, which damps down the immune system, to the mucosal surfaces, the wet surfaces of the body, you're more susceptible to getting infections such as thrush. And so if you get an unusually sore, red, angry mouth, and particularly these white sort of spots in it, some treatment specifically for thrush can make that better. I mentioned that um, there is an increased risk of lymphoma with, with Sjogren's, and the sort of things that that can be a, an indicator of that happening is if there are persistent swellings, either in the face, as this lady has, or in the neck, or under the arms, or in the groins. Now, I should add, there are many reasons why that might happen. So if you've got a swelling of that sort, it might just be you've got a stone in your salivary gland. It might not mean that you've got a, a lymphoma, but it's important to let somebody know about it. Similarly, um, and in any case, if you have fevers, high fevers all the time, or you're losing weight without trying to, you should, you should certainly mention that. Right, um, what do we do about it? Well, um, we try to control the underlying disease activity, although I would have to say that usually doesn't have much of an effect on the dryness. It might well improve the joint pains and the muscle pains and hopefully also the fatigue, but it usually doesn't affect the dryness at least not with the conventional agents that we've used. But we tend to use a lot of hydroxychloroquine because it does seem to help some of those other systemic features. Um, interestingly, because the B cells that, um, that, that David Jane um, showed us tend to be very overactive in Sjogren's, there is an ongoing trial. And one or two of you in here might possibly be involved in it, an, an ongoing trial called Tractis, in which we're looking at the effect of, of rituximab in, in Sjogren's. Pragmatically, if you have dry eyes, obviously you want to use something to make them feel less dry, so there are a, a range of drops. Some of the watery drops, the aqueous based drops, are useful for, for using frequently throughout the day, but they evaporate very quickly. So slightly more viscous drops, such as carbamellos, the drops that contain carbamers, can be quite useful. And at night, a heavier based ointment like lacrylube, it's very blurry to look through, but it gives the eyes a good sort of rest overnight.
Some people use artificial saliva. I have to say most people have fed back to me that that's not very helpful and they prefer to carry around a, a bottle of water. Um, water is fine. Obviously, avoid sugary drinks because given that the dental um, decay is more of a problem, you don't want to feed the bacteria with any sugary um, substrates. Um, Many of you would have gone to see uh, one of our eye doctors, and sometimes if you have dry eyes, then blocking the, the tear duct can be an effective strategy because then any tears that you do manage to make are held in the conjunctival sac and not lost. So that's quite useful. And that can be done with a temporary plug, and if that's successful, that can be done permanently. Now, occasionally we use pilocarpine, a salivary stimulant, because it helps or may help the saliva to flow and that might sound like an excellent strategy. The, the only problem is that it does this by, by stimulating the little nerves that go into the glands, and those little nerves also do all, all sorts of other useful jobs in the bowel and in the bladder and in the eye, helping you to focus. And so sometimes when we use pilocarping, we might actually help you make more saliva, but if it gives you the runs or makes you have to rush to the loo and then you can't see where you're going, that's not always such an advantage. <laughs> So um, that's not our most popular strategy. Right, tips and tricks. So water, not sugary drinks. Little sips of water rather than bucket loads of water because otherwise you can actually dilute your blood too much. Humidify your environment at home if you've got central heating. So plants transpire water. Bowls of water just to humidify the environment. That's a good idea. Actually, I haven't put this on the list here, but if you're doing some really dusty task, DIY, or in the garden, and you're not worried about being a fashion, fashion icon at that time, then one of those wraparound sets of goggles, you, you might look like biggles, but it will actually keep your eyes protected and keep the humidity up in the, in the area around the eyes. So that's worth thinking about, um, but probably not for party time. Um, Avoid caffeine. That would be a useless instruction to give me, but um, for those of you that are not quite as hooked on caffeine as I am, you might be able to limit the number of cups of tea and coffee you have in the day. And um, get a good relationship with your dentist and tell them you've got a dry mouth. I'm sure they will have noticed it anyway, but make sure you're having a regular checkup of your te teeth and your gums. The salivary stimulants I've, I've mentioned, pilocarpine's not so great, but you could try sugar-free, and I stress the sugar-free uh, gums or, or, or hard sweets to suck. Then for the skin, which does often get very dry, a thick, moilient skin like E45, and for the itching problems, sometimes um, an aqueous cream with some menthol in it, particularly in the, in the warmer summer months, that can be quite cooling and, and soothing, um, and a, a vino cream with aloe in it is, is helpful for lots of people. Um, vaginal lubricant is a good idea, obviously, if you're getting um, dryness in that department, it could provide some relief. And the antipyritic uh, creams I've mentioned. Again, there's another um, ARUK booklet that you can download with this and, um, and more information. And this is the last of um, Salvador Dali's pictures I'm going to give you. I thought that was a particularly apt picture for this forum and seemed to be a rather positive and hopeful looking image. So I hope that canter through Reynos and Sjogren's has been useful and I hope there are some tips and tricks that are beneficial and please let me know if you have more that I haven't mentioned. Thank you.